All right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask that you turn to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and uh, while you're turning there, I would uh, ask you to remember our missionaries, if you've been watching the hurricane, um, it took a different direction, and Brother Fayard and his family are safe there in Mississippi, and we give the Lord the praise for that, but pray for those that have lost their homes and some have lost their lives. I was looking at just a little bit of the footage on Facebook and, and literally just foundations sitting there where our house used to be. And uh, I can't imagine losing everything you have in, in one event, but the Lord is sufficient. I guess it will tell you where your love's at at least. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and we're going to begin reading in verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter number 4, beginning in verse 23, the Bible says, Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image, or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image or the likeness of any thing, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, and you shall soon utterly perish from all the land whereunto you go ever uh, over Jordan to possess it. You shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there, shall, and there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, yeah. wood and stone, which neither can see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But if thou from thence shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. Thou shalt seek him with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for a time to be with your people. Lord God, we thank you for this Lord today that you've given us. God, we thank you that we would be allowed to preach with your strength this morning. Lord, we pray that we would uh, be careful to seek your face every time as we become before you in preaching. God, honor your word this morning, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of those that are here. Lord, that you would stir the saved. God, it would be your mercy and grace to grant it that you would save someone this morning. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in his name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, this is the beginning of Moses' final address uh, to his people. And he makes a couple of predictions and he makes a couple of, uh, of cautions to his people. Now, all along your walk with the Lord, you're going to have faithful men that give you cautions along the way. See, that's the problem today with these mega churches, and everything's good and nothing is bad. There, there's, no, there's no warnings in that. And so when something comes aside and something comes awry, they're really not sure what to do. Now, if we're to be directed according to the Word of God as pilgrims and strangers, we don't settle in here. And a lot of times, catastrophe makes us look at, are we really where we need to be in the work of the Lord? And so Moses gives his people uh, some advice. Now, we'll be looking at seeking the Almighty, because at the end of our text, that's what they're directed to do is to seek, seek. Now, anytime you're directed by the word of the Lord to do something, I would want to know how do you get it done. Now, uh, I think uh, we, uh, we sometimes as sovereign grace people, we don't leave a lot of room for seeking, but yet again, the word of God says time and time again, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. So that has to be a process. 
process, and that has to be something the Word of God sanctions, or He wouldn't ask us to do it. Right. And, and so I ask you, how much time do you spend in seeking the Lord? Looking for the person of the Almighty. Looking for His will for your life. See, uh, we need some seekers, don't we? And, and we need some people that will look unto Christ uh, for their every movement, for everything that they do. And as Moses is about to die, that's the advice that he gives. First of all, very common advice, but very good advice, take heed unto yourselves. Now, whether we uh, want to acknowledge it or not, you're responsible. Everything we do, everything we go about uh, accomplishing, we're responsible. You know, I always whipped my kids and be and, and to let them know when they were out of line because it makes them responsible. That they know that there is a consequence to their action. Uh, you know what? You look around. I was telling I was telling Sister Brenda about this altercation I had at work the other day, and, and you know what? We raised out the time the time out generation, and look what a mess we got. They don't even know when to work. And, and, and so we find as Moses is giving his final address, he says, you know what? You are responsible. Those of you that are saved, you are responsible for your walk with the Lord. Those of you that are lost, you're responsible for the care of your own soul. You are responsible. And in the day that we live like today, people don't like that to hear that. Take heed unto yourself. Be cautious. Look what's going on around you. Uh, guard up yourself. You know what? You, you ask yourself, how much time do you spend in prayer for yourself? Now, I spend a lot of time in prayer for my children and for this church that I try to pastor and for people that I know and for lost people that have come across my path. But you know, if I, I really have to look at it, I don't pray much for myself. But he says, take heed to yourself. You're responsible. You be cautious. You, you look at what's going around, uh, going on around you. Take heed unto yourself. Take heed unto yourselves. Why not? Or why? Lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God. Now, I am not a person that believes in covenant theology. Uh, I believe the covenants of God are past. I believe we live in the age of grace. But what, what, what a covenant is, is, is you remember your obligation. A covenant is an agreement. Like when Don and I married, we committed ourselves to each other. That's a covenant that will hold for the rest of our lives, whether we keep it or not. The covenant still exists. So them understanding the Mosaic Covenant, they, he reminded about them. Remember what your obligation is. You remember how you are connected to the Lord. You remember who the Lord is. And uh, if you do that, you'll always feel like you're obligated to him. You know what? We, we live in a day and age today where people lack obligation. You know, they have two or three kids and walk off and leave them. Uh, they give up their obligation. That, that's their kids. They're supposed to take care of them. And, and, and so he says, you look unto the covenant. And why? Because you're obligated to feel it. You're obligated to understand. Hey, take heed unto yourself, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a graven image. Now, most of the rest of this text is a warning about idolatry. Now, Whatever that idol is, it will get in your way. Now, a lot of times, people think of idols, and Catholic Church is full of them. And, but, you know, a lot of times an idol is nothing more than your job. It doesn't have to be something we can hold and feel of. It can be a girlfriend. It can be a wife. It could be a husband. And, and so he says, I'm warning you about idolatry. Anything that stands between you and your service 
to, of the Lord, it is an idol. It, it, it derails you. It takes you off track. It, it keeps you from serving the Lord in the way in which you should. Be careful of idols. The rest of that verse says, which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now, how many times do you hear the Lord God uh, described as a consuming fire in the modern day? I would say next to nothing because you know what? People don't want to hear about that kind of God. Uh, what is fire for? Fire is a pure fire. It's to get the dross out. It's to get rid of the waste. And our Lord is a consuming fire. And you know what? Sometimes he does get angry with us. Sometimes he does get a burning judgment against us. And you know what? It's always for our good. Now, when we begin to think of that and think of the fire that we may experience, we think about broken legs and, and broken arms. No, no. You know, you know all that Peter's uh, all that Peter's fire was was a chicken crowing. And that's all it took. Mm. One way we've been, didn't you? So we see that that our Lord is in this business of being jealous of us. So when we get out there in the world and the world becomes more important to us than him, listen, trouble's on the way. And you know what? People that can live in that mess year after year and God never judge them, I very, very much doubt they've ever been born again to start with because our God will not violate his character and he is a jealous God. He's jealous of your time. He's jealous of your energies. He wants it for himself. So if you can, if you get out there and live anything any way that you want to and, and, and never be troubled about it, and God never bring uh, problems into your life, again, I don't know that you really have what you think you have. And, and, and so he makes it very clear of the character of our God. Verse 25, when thou shalt beget children, and children's children. Now that's two generations. <clears throat> Heard old brother uh, Rich time and time again, L.G. Richardson say, we're one, one generation from the church going down. And he's right. Now, my children's children uh, have four grandchildren. And notice it's not your children's children's children. It's your children's children. One generation. My children's children Gracie and AJ and Abigail and Madeline. That's one generation from me. And he says, when you get over there, your grandchildren are going to do this. So how, how can we prevent that? Bring them down to the house of God. Uh, remind them how important it is. Don't let them lay out. Don't let them, uh, you know what? The most important thing we have here is teaching and preaching for our children. The meal afterwards is important, but you know what? I'd rather have bologna and tomato and our children hearing the Word of God than anything else. Listen, I've ate bologna, tomato, and hot meat lots of time, and you know what? It feels an empty spot. I would rather my children hear the preached Word of God. And, and, and so we find then that Moses, through the person of the Lord God, makes a prediction, hey, your grandchildren are going to be in trouble. And, and you think about that, how different it is uh, from generation to generation. Now, uh, I remember my great-grandmother, my grandmother's mother. And uh, you know what? I never saw her in a pair of britches ever. And you know what? Uh, you know what? As far as I know, she didn't understand that truth. I don't know if a lot was only four when she died. But you know why? Because that's how she was taught. And you know why it changed? Because my grandmother, Nanny we called her, she wore breeches. My mother used to wear breeches. My sister wore breeches. So what changed? The generations, is it not? Mm -hmm. And you know what? Christ still intervened. And I look at some of my cousin's children, and I'm a call. I mean, I, I, I am unbelievably amazed at what they led in their lives. 
And so it was an easy prediction that Moses was making because, see, things wax worse and worse, not better and better. You know, we live in a, a generation, some people take uh, Jehovah's Witness, if you want to call them that, they're a bunch of Russellites is what they are. They, they really believe that, that utopia will be ushered in by their groups. But you know what? If that's true, why do things get worse and worse? Do you see a utopia coming? Do you see uh, when people are, are literally being beat to death on the streets of our city? Do you, do you think that's a good thing? No, things are worse and worse and worse. And, and so we find that even in the days of Moses, he made a very real prediction of what was coming ahead. Notice it says, And you shall have remained long in the land, not maybe, and shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image. He says, you're going to do this to yourself. It's not coming by me. You know, uh, one thing about the doctrines of election and predestination, we want to blame God, right? Well, he didn't elect him. No, no, that doesn't take about one snivel of your responsibility to God. Every one of, every one of us are responsible to God. You know how? The law. Everybody, oh, the law is the Old Testament. No, the law is our schoolmaster, and it teaches us what's wrong and what's right, and it defines sin, and it makes you guilty. It makes you guilty before God. And, and so we find then that uh, he says, you're going to do this. You're going to become idolaters. You're going to become uh, a people that worship things instead of God, uh, or the likeness of any thing, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. Now, you, you think about this real long and hard. Now, you go into the average church, and I use that extremely loosely, you're going to have crucifixes, you're going to have images that's supposed to be like unto Christ, and, and you're going to have all these things. You know what that is? It's idolatry. That, that's exactly what it is. You know what? We don't know what Christ looked like, do we? I'll say this. He wasn't a white man. Well, he wasn't as white as me. I'll put it that way. And he sure didn't have long hair. Because, see, that's a violation of Scripture, is it not? He, he would never violate Scripture in any way. It, it, it was outside his character. It would have been an impossibility, Right? And, and, and so we find then, if we get these ideas of Christ, you know what it is? It's an idol. It's exactly what it is. It's an idol. You see Catholic people doing this? You know what it is? That's an idol. Nothing more. And, and so we find then, as the Lord's true people, we need to be acutely aware of what idolatry was about because it did creep in just as Moses predicted. Verse 26, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. Now, can you imagine the power of that statement? You ever been in a courtroom, you've seen witnesses come and, and describe what they've seen, describe, describe what they've done. And he says, I'm going to have heaven and earth witness against you. You know, uh, I had the Red Sea cut apart. It opened it up. Uh, it was opened up by the power of the Almighty. You ran across, and you know what? You forgot the goodness of God and testifies against them. It, it says, uh, and, and you think about the, when they held up Moses' hands, that's a testimony against him. And remember what he said, uh, the prophet said, just turn back the time, uh, uh, I think for an hour. And you know what? It testified against them all. And you know what? Today, even today, this earth and the heavens above testify, testify against the unbeliever. Now, uh, uh, I don't like to stir up hornet's nests, and I, I really didn't mean to do this, but some time ago, uh, there was this smart comment about on Facebook 
about how we descended from apes. And I thought, well, I'm going to fix you up. And uh, y'all remember, only us old ones will remember, but everybody, Jared and Sarah won't remember, these little ones. But y'all remember years ago, it was in 82, when they put that heart of a baboon in a little child. Yeah. And, and she lived three hours and died from rejection. Not from the car heart condition, she died from rejection. You know why? Because that baboon was no near, nowhere near us. It's an animal, and, and we're made in the image and likeness of Almighty God. And, and, and you know, I put that on there, and, you know, there are all these comments, and uh, this one guy, I guess he couldn't come up with anything else, and it was just on there this morning. That was months ago. I actually forgot about doing it. And he says, you're a Christian, ain't, ain't you? And I said, See, they want to acknowledge it, but nature witnessed against them, did it not? It said, no, you're not an animal. You're not a baboon. You're a human being. And this won't work. And that's exactly what it did. And so we find that the, the indictment that, uh, that Moses made against Israel happened all around us says, yes, there's a God. There's a Holy One of Israel all around us. It is the person of the Almighty. And heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it, and ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. Their judgment was coming. Uh, verse 27, And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number, and among the heathen, whether the Lord shall send you. That happened in the days of Jeremiah. And there shall be, and, and there you shall serve gods, the works of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. Now, uh, again, Except for very few, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were captured and taken into the land, they took up the diet of that land. They took up the gods of that land. You, you remember, uh, uh, we all need to be careful what we eat, both physically and spiritually. You know, uh, you know, they're, they're in that land. Do you remember what, what Daniel asked? He says, we're not going to eat all this stuff. And he just wanted basically some gruel, some cornmeal and uh, uh, water mixed up together, something very basic. He says, that's the diet of the Jew. And you know what? They flourished on it. See, God's people will flourish on the word of God. But you know what? I have seen some people, supposed to be God's people, you know, pick up and read just about anything. Church of Christ papers, Jehovah's Witness papers, just crazy stuff. You know what? That's not on our diet. That, that, that's not what we ought to eat. And even the Southern Baptist literature, literature, you know what? We don't need that. This is the diet we need. And you know what? If you don't understand it, keep reading it. If it doesn't speak to you, keep praying and dig deeper and deeper and deeper into this good old King James Bible that's being thrown aside by even people that say they believe like us. And so we, we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know we're not to be involved with that in any way. Notice the attributes of an idol. And there, meaning in that land of captivity, and there you shall serve gods. Notice little g, gods, not the real one. The work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. Now, you know what? That's really the type of God man wants. One that can't see or hear. That way you can pretty much do what you want to do. And there's no awareness from God. But let me, let me tell you this morning. He sees all, knows all, hears all. And uh, he even knows the intents of your mind. 
That's very humbling. And in other words, he knows how filthy we are and still looks on us in grace. See, that, that is the difference, is it not? That, that, that is what makes the difference between our God, the real mighty God of heaven, and all the gods that are out there today. That is the difference. Now, I'm going to read verse 29. But if from thence, meaning captivity, meaning slavery, slavery, meaning in that faraway land, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God. Now, you can answer this to yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to say anything out loud, but how much time did you spend in seeking this morning? Looking for the throne of grace. Praying for me as your pastor. Praying for yourself. Praying that the Lord God might fill this building this morning with his Holy Ghost. And he might speak to us in unusual ways. And might be filled and, and see some people saved. We need to learn to seek. And, and just like in the days of Moses, even so today... Sadly, it has to be in pretty desperate situations before we get seeking. Anything. They were in slavery. Their freedom had been taken. They were nothing but bonds people. And he says, when you get there, begin to seek the Lord. Begin to look for him. Begin to be enticed. So how do you do this? You know, if he gives us a command to seek, how do we accomplish the command that he's given us? How do you seek the Lord? You you answer that for yourself. How, how do you uh, uh, how do you uh, find find the Lord? Now, most of us will say that it has to be closely connected with prayer, and I, I would have to uh, I would have to agree with that. But how do you do that? What's your average prayer like? Where does it start? Where does it end? When you're finished, do you feel like you've gotten hold of God? Now, sometimes I have to say I do, and sometimes, very sadly, and I'll be, but at least I'll be honest with you, I, I, I don't think I've gotten anywhere. Uh, we need to spend time in prayer. Now, when you're seeking, Bible said, the Lord Jesus said in his own ministry, if you, if you shall seek, you shall find. Right? Now, when you hear from God, you find. Now, this is the problem that I found in my own Christian life, and I'm sure I'm not in great difference than anybody else in the room. A lot of times I don't like what I find. Right? right? Uh, uh, go before the throne of grace, and, and, and you know what? This is one of the, always one of the first things I find, and the, and the first impulse of the flesh is to pull away. The first thing I find is how ungodly I really am. Right? If we'd be honest, that's what we would have to say. So when you begin to find, don't call it. You know, the first time, you know, the first thing we react to do when you see really how much in need of Christ you really are, and you see how wicked you are, is just to recall. But you know what? That's a good thing to find. I'll tell you this, if nothing else, it'll keep you humble. Uh, what if his will is to go far away from here and preach the gospel? That'll cause you to recall a woman. Because you know what? We like to be in our comfort zone. That's right. I mean, I have had people here in this county since it was Tennessee County, North Carolina. That's a pretty good comfort zone, man. it? But you know what? He might say South America is going to be your new home. And you know what I'd have to say? I know in the beginning, at least, I would recall. So don't seek if you don't want to find. Keep, you know, you, you might as well get hard and dry and sit there if you're not going to embrace what you find. So, uh, you know, Mama always told me, Larry, if you're going to go looking for trouble, you're going to find it. And you know what? I found that to be true. 
And if you're going to go seeking the Lord's will, be receptive. When you find it, embrace it. But if thou from thence shalt seek the Lord thy God, and thou shalt find him, a guarantee, not a maybe, but a true, if thou seek him with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Now that seems repetitious, but uh, it is not. One of it is spiritual, and as bad as we hate to say it, one of it is physical. I even looked up the heart to be sure it wasn't talking about the soul of man, and it's not. The soul word there is talking about the soul of man. The heart is this ticker right here. That means you're seeking with your body. You seek him with energy. You seek him uh, by fasting. You, you, you seek him with what this body does still possess. And, uh, you know, I had somebody at work tell me the other day, and I was hassling pretty good a couple, probably maybe four or five days ago. And they said, Larry, aren't you mad at God? I didn't even know what they're talking about. I said, well, no. <laughs> I love the Lord. And they said, you can't even breathe well anymore. And I said, I can breathe better than these patients. Amen. See, so you got you got to seek the Lord. In every situation, in everything you do, you seek the Lord. And you know what? I've, I've never found you not faithful and giving me a great blessing and, 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 and fulfilling that need. Seeking with all thy heart and with all thy soul when thou art in tribulation. Now this morning I ask you, are you in a tribulation period in your life? Just like Brother Junior was talking about, if you get too much of the filth and the junk and think about the chaos that's going on in our world right now, it'll make you sick. You know what that is? That's tribulation. And you know what? The best assignment that I can give you, the best remedy I can give you, seek the Lord. Uh, you know, he's not lost control. He, he, it's not outside his will. You know what? Uh, we need to understand and know that he is in control and he doeth all things well. Now, very quickly, I want to go to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, and uh, we're going to read about 10 verses very quickly. Matthew chapter 4, in the first verse, Matthew chapter 4, the verse first, the first verse, the Bible says that Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, it says, led up of the Spirit. Little S Spirit. Not the Holy Ghost. Not capital S Spirit, but the little S Spirit. You, you, you know what uh, your spirit is? It's a, that inward man. In other words, somehow the mighty God of heaven said, Now Jesus, you need to go up onto that top of that mountain. And he was obedient. Now, God, the Lord Jesus being God in the flesh, he knew the devil was up there. He, he, he knew that the devil was going to attack him, but yet he was obedient. And, and you know, this is the difference between us and unto Christ is this. We don't know what's into the road. We just got to go. Be led of the Spirit. If he speaks to this uh, inward man, listen, you be obedient and you do it. You follow his direction. And I, and I guarantee you, he will bless you every time. It will be, it may not be what you want, but it will be what he, what is a great blessing. Verse 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Now, I want you to notice uh, two things. First of all, he, uh, the devil came at his weakness. You, you know when the, the devil's going to attack you at your weakest. Now, I don't know what your weakness is, and your, weak, your weakest will be different than mine. 
but he is going to come when you don't have a whole lot to fight with. In other words, if you're on a spiritual high and things has been good at church and things is good uh, with your family, you know what? He's probably not going to show up. But you think about little Micah up there, and I shouldn't say little, but I just remember when he was this big. Uh, you know, that, that, that's a vulnerable time for Tammy and uh, Sean, is it not? See one of your kids all broken up. You know what? Bless be God, I never had to see that. God's been good to me. My kids generally have very good health. And in a moment's notice, it was totally given the whole world changed. See, that'd be a good time for the devil to come and say to Sean, you ain't nothing. You see, you think you're serving a God and he's about taking your boy away from you. See, that, that's the nature of Satan, is it not? He does it every time. And, and, and so we find that as the Lord Jesus was at a weak point physically, he comes and he, and he tries to hinder uh, he tries to convince the Lord Jesus that he's not who he is. Uh, verse 4, but he, meaning Christ, answered, said, if it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, ye shall not get he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil taketh him up into exceeding high mountain, and shew him with all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things wilt thou will all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get the hint, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. So I want you to see that the way that you can build yourself up, the way that you can be ready to seek the Lord is know the scripture. Know the scripture is just like that fellow trying to trying to convince Jared of baptismal regeneration. If you didn't know the Bible, you could fall for it. You know, there's a, a scripture in the Bible, and the uh, Mormons use it baptized for them. And if you look at that verse, it does sound like that I could be baptized for Jared, and Jared could be baptized for me. And even going further, now again, that's out of context, but it is there that I could be baptized for David over there in our little cemetery. That's, but see, when you look at it in context, it's not uh, saying that at all. What it is really saying by my testimony Sarah might see what the truth is. It's for what I did and not in their place. But you see, if I, if I didn't know that, and one of the little guys on his bike and his, and his, and his black breeches and his black tie come by and say, hey, Larry, what about this? And I'll say, well, this is what the Bible says. You know what I'm saying? So I ask you, how long has it been since you saw the Lord? Seek him in prayer, seek him in, in his word, seek him in preaching, seek him in teaching. How long has it been that you really sought the Lord? And if you really are seeking him, what he gives you, would you embrace it? Would you say, yes, Lord, that's exactly what I want because that's what you want? Would you be willing to do 